Preface to the Collected Poems of Lord Alfred Douglas Recording by Rob Marland The poems in this collection, dating from about 1890 to the present year, 1919, are printed in something approximating to chronological order. Consequently, readers are invited to note that the best poems are not, generally speaking, to be found in the beginning of the volume. Alfred Douglas End of section. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Apologia by Lord Alfred Douglas. Recording by Larry Wilson. Tell me not of philosophies, of morals, ethics, laws of life. Give me no subtle theories, no instruments of wordy strife. I will not forge laborious chains link after link till seven times seven. I need no ponderous iron cranes to haul my soul from earth to heaven. But with a burnished wing, rainbow hued in the sun, I will dive and leap and run in the air, and I will bring back to the earth a heavenly thing. I will dance through the stars and past the blue bars of heaven. I will catch hands with God and speak with him. I will kiss the lips of the seraphim and the deep-eyed cherubim. I will pluck the flowers that nod row upon row upon row in the infinite gardens of God, to the breath of the wind of the sweep of the lyres, and the cry of the strings and the golden wires, and the mystical musical things that the world may not know. Oxford, 1892 End of Poem this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Autumn Days by Lord Alfred Douglas Recording by Phil Schempf I have been through the woods today, and the leaves were falling. Summer had crept away, and the birds were not calling. And the bracken was like yellow gold that comes too late, when the heart is sad and old and death at the gate. Ah, mournful autumn, sad, slow death that comes at last. I am mad for a yesterday, mad. I am sick for a year that is past. Though the sun be like blood in the sky, he is cold as the lips of hate, and he fires the sere leaves as they lie on their bed of earth too late. They are dead, and the bare trees weep not loud as mortal weeping, but as sorrow that sighs in sleep, and as grief that is still in sleeping. The Hut, 1890 End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To Shakespeare by Lord Alfred Douglas Recording by Hernandez most tuneful singer, lover tenderest, most sad, most piteous, and most musical, thine is the shrine, more pilgrim-worn than all, the shrine of singers, high above the rest, thy trumpet sounds most loud, most manifest, yet better were, if a lonely call, of woodland birds, a song, a madrigal, were all the jetsam of thy seas unrest, for now thy praises have become too loud, On vulgar lips and every yelping cur, Yaps the Apean, the wild's little men, Not tall enough to worship in a crowd, Spit their small wits at thee, Ah, better than the broken shrine, The lonely worshipper. End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Amoris Vincula by Lord Alfred Douglas, recording by Hernandez. As a white dove that in a cage of gold is prisoned from the air and yet more bound by love than bars and will not wings unfold to fly away though every gate be found, unlocked and open so my heart was caught and linked to thine with triple links of love. But soon a dove grown wanton faults its sought to break its chain, and faithless quite to rove, where thou wouldst not, and with a painted bird, fluttered far off. But when a moon was past, 
grown sick with longing for a voice unheard and lips unkissed spread wings and home flew fast and lo what seemed a sword to cleave its chain was but a link to rivet it again end of poem this librivox recording is in the public domain A Summer Storm by Lord Alfred Douglas Recording by Valentina Vicelli Alas, how frail and weak a little boat I have sailed in. I called it happiness, and I had thought there was not a storm nor stress of wind so masterful but it would float blithely in their despite. But lo, one note of harsh discord, one word of bitterness, and a fierce overwhelming wilderness of angry waters chokes my gasping throat. I am near drowned in this unhappy sea. I will not strive. Let me lie still and sink. I have no joy to live. Oh, unkind love, why have you wounded me so bitterly? That am as easily wounded as a dove who has a silver throat and feet of pink. End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Winter Sunset by Lord Alfred Douglas Recording by Valentina Vicelli The frosty sky like a furnace burning, The keen air crisp and cold, And a sunset that splashes the clouds with gold, But my heart to summer turning. Come back, sweet summer, come back again. I hate the snow, and the icy winds that the northlands blow, And the fall of the frozen rain. I hate the iron ground and the Christmas roses, And the sickly day that dies when it closes with never a song or a sound. Come back, come back with your passionate heat and glowing hazes, and your sun that shines as a lover gazes, and your day with the tired feet. End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In Summer by Lord Alfred Douglas Recording by Valentina Vicelli there were the black pine trees and the sullen hills frowning. There were trills of birds and the sweet hot sun and the little rills of water, everyone singing and prattling. There were bees, honey-laden, tuneful, a song far off, and a timid air that sighed and kissed my hair, my hair that the hot sun loves. The day was very fair. There was wooing of doves and the shadows were not yet long. And I lay on the soft green grass, and the smell of the earth was sweet, and I dipped my feet in the little stream, and was cool as a flower is cool in the heat, and the day lay still in a dream, and the hours forgot to pass. And you came, my love, so stealthily that I saw you not, till I felt that your arms were hot round my neck, and my lips were wet with your lips. I had forgot how sweet you were, and lo, the sun has set, and the pale moon came up silently. Turingavolt, 1892 End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In Winter by Lord Alfred Douglas. Recording by Valentina Vicelli. Oh, for a day of burning noon and a sun like a glowing ember. Oh, for one hour of golden June in the heart of this chill November. I can scarcely remember the spring's soft breath or imagine the summer hazes. The yellow woods are so damp with death that I have forgotten the daisies. Oh, to lie watching the sky again from a nest of hot grass and clover till the stars come out like golden rain when the lazy day is over and crowning the night with an aureole as the clouds kiss and drift asunder, the moon floats up like a luminous soul and the stars grow pale for wonder. End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In Serum Close by Lord Alfred Douglas Recording by Hernandez Tired of passion and the love that brings Satiety's unrest and failing sands Of life 
I thought to cool my burning hands in this calm twilight of gray gothic things, but love has laughed and spreading swifter wings than my poor pinions once again with bands of silken strength my fainting heart commands, and once again he plays on passionate strings. But thou, my love, my flower, my jewel, set in a fair setting, help me or I die, to bear love's burden for that load to share, is sweet and pleasant, but if lonely I must love unloved, tis pain, shine we, my fair, two neighbor jewels in love's coronet. End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Sphinx by Lord Alfred Douglas. Recording by Andrew Gauntz. I gaze across the Nile, flame like and red, the sun goes down, and all the western sky is drowned in somber crimson. Wearily, a great bird flaps along with wings of lead, black on the rose red river. Over my head, the sky is hard green bronze, beneath me lie the sleeping ships. There is no sound or sigh of the wind's breath. The stillness of the dead. Over a palm tree's top I see the peaks of the tall pyramids, and though my eyes are barred from it I know that on the sand crouches a thing of stone that in some wise broods on my heart, and from the darkening land creeps fear into my soul in whisper speaks. British Agency, Cairo, 1893. End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Impression de Nuit by Lord Alfred Douglas, recording by Hernandez. London. See what a mass of gems the city wears upon her broad live bosom, row on row, rubies and emeralds and amethysts glow. See that huge circle like a necklace stares with thousands of bold eyes to heaven and dares the golden stars to dim the lamps below. And in the mirror of the mire I know, the moon has left her image unawares. That's the great town at night, I see her breasts, pricked out with lamps, they stand like huge black towers, I think they move, I hear her panting breath, and that's her head where the tiara rests, and in her brain, through lanes as dark as death, men creep like thoughts, the lamps are like pale flowers. London, 1894. End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To L by Lord Alfred Douglas. Recording by Andrew Gauntz. Thou that wast once my loved and loving friend, a friend no more, I had forgot thee quite. Why hast thou come to trouble my delight with memories? Oh, I had clean made end of all that time. I had made haste to send my soul into red places and to light a torch of pleasure to burn up my night. What I have woven hast thou come to rend? In silent acres of forgetful flowers, crowned as of old with happy daffodils, long time my wounded soul has been astraying. Alas, it has chanced now on somber hours of hard remembrances and sad delaying, leaving green valleys for the bitter hills. End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Night Coming Into a Garden by Lord Alfred Douglas Roses red and white, every rose is hanging her head. Silently comes the lady night, only the flowers can hear her tread. All day long the birds have been calling, calling shrill and sweet. They are still when she comes with her long robe falling, falling down to her feet. The thrush has sung to his mate. She is coming, hush, she is coming. She is lifting the latch at the gate, and the bees have ceased from their humming. I cannot see her face as she passes through my garden of white and red, but I know she has walked where the daisies and grasses are curtsying after her tread. She has passed me by with a rustle and sweep of her robe, as she passed I heard it sweeping, and all my red roses have fallen asleep, and all my white roses are sleeping. End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.
Night Coming Out of a Garden by Lord Alfred Douglas Through the still air of night suddenly comes, alone and shrill, like the far-off voice of the distant light, the single piping trill of a bird that has caught the scent of the dawn and knows that the night is over. She has poured her dews on the velvet lawn and drenched the long grass and the clover. And now with her naked white feet she is silently passing away, out of the garden and into the street, over the long yellow fields of the wheat, till she melts in the arms of the day. And from the great gates of the east, with a clang and a brazen blare, forth from the rosy wine and the feast comes the god with the flame-flaked hair. The hoofs of his horses ring on the golden stones, and the wheels of his chariot burn and sing, and the earth beneath him reels, and forth with a rush and a rout his myriad angels run, and the world is awake with a shout, he is coming, the sun, the sun. End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Perkin Warbeck by Lord Alfred Douglas At Turney, in Flanders, I was born foredoomed to splendour and sorrow, for I was a king when they cut the corn, and they strangle me tomorrow. Oh, why was I made so red and white, so fair and straight and tall, and why were my eyes so blue and bright, and my hands so white and small? And why was my hair like the yellow silk, and curled like the hair of the king, and my body like the soft new milk that the maids bring from milking? I was nothing but a weaver's son, I was born in a weaver's bed. My brothers toiled and my sisters spun, and my mother wove for our bread. I was the latest child she had, and my mother loved me the best. She would laugh for joy and anon be sad that I was not as the rest. For my brothers and sisters were black as the gate whereby I shall pass tomorrow, but I was white and delicate and born to splendour and sorrow. And my father the weaver died full soon, but my mother lived for me, and I had silk doublets and satin shoon and was nurtured tenderly. And the good priests had much joy of me, for I had wisdom and wit, and there was no tongue or subtlety but I could master it. And when I was fourteen summers old there came an English knight, with purple cloak and spurs of gold and sword of chrysolite. He rode through the town both sad and slow, and his hands lay in his lap. He wore a scarf as white as the snow and a snow-white rose in his cap. And he passed me by in the marketplace, and he reined his horse and stared, and I looked him fair and full in the face, and he stayed with his head all bared. And he leaped down quick and bowed his knee and took hold on my hand, and he said, Is it ghost or wraith that I see, or the white rose of England? And I answered him in the Flemish tongue, My name is Peter Warbecker. From Catherine de Faro I am sprung, and my father was John Osbecker. My father toiled and weaved with his hand and bare neither sword nor shield, and the white rose of fair England turned red on Bosworth Field. And he answered, What matter for anything? For God hath given to thee the voice of the king and the face of the king, and the king thou shalt surely be. And he wrought on me till the vesper bell, and I rode forth out of the town, and I might not bid my mother farewell, lest her love should seem more than a crown. And the sun went down, and the night waxed black, and the wind sang wearily. And I thought on my mother, and would have gone back, but he would not suffer me. And we rode and we rode, was it nine days or three, till we heard the bells that ring for my cousin Margaret of Burgundy. And I was indeed a king. For I had a hundred fighting men to come at my beck and call, and I had silk and fine linen to line my bed withal. They dressed me all in silken dresses, and little I wot did they wreck of the precious scents for my golden tresses, and the golden chains for my neck. And all the path for the rose to walk was strewn with flowers and posies, I was the milk-white rose of York, the rose of all the roses. And the Lady Margaret taught me well, till I spake without lisping, of Warwick and Clarence and Isabel, and my father, Edward the King. And I sailed to Ireland and to France, and I sailed to fair Scotland, and had much honour and pleasance, and Catherine Gordon's hand. And after that what brooks it to say whither I went or why, I was as loath to leave my play and fight as now to die. For I was not made for wars and strife and blood and slaughtering. I was but a boy that loved his life, and I had not the heart of a king. Oh, why hath God dealt so hardly with me, that such a thing should be done, that a boy should be born with a king's body and the heart of a weaver's son? I was well pleased to be at the court, lord of the thing that seems, 
It was merry to be a prince for sport, a king in a kingdom of dreams. But ever they said I must strive and fight to wrest away the crown, so I came to England in the night and I warred on Exeter town. And the king came up with a mighty host, and what could I do but fly? I had three thousand men at the most, and I was most loath to die. And they took me and brought me to London town, and I stood where all men might see, I that had well nigh worn a crown in shameful pillory. And I cried these words in the English tongue, I am Peter Warbecker, from Catherine de Faro I am sprung, and my father was John Osbecker. My father toiled and weaved with his hand, and bare neither sword nor shield, and the white rose of fair England turned red on Bosworth Field. And they gave me my life, but they held me fast within this weary place, but I wrought on my guards ere a month was past, with my wit and my comely face. And they were ready to set me free, but when it was almost done, and I thought I should gain the narrow sea and look on the face of the sun, the lord of the tower had word of it, and alas for my poor hope, for this is the end of my face and my wit, that tomorrow I die by the rope. And the time draws nigh, and the darkness closes, and the night is almost done. What had I to do with their roses, I, the poor weaver's son? They promised me a bed so rich, and a queen to be my bride, and I have gotten a narrow ditch and a stake to pierce my side. They promised me a kingly part and a crown my head to deck, and I have gotten the hangman's cart and a hempen cord for my neck. Oh, I would that I had never been born to splendour and shame and sorrow, for it's ill riding to grim to born where I must ride tomorrow. I shall dress me all in silk and scarlet, and the hangman shall have my ring, for though I be hanged like a low-born varlet, they shall know I was once a king. And may I not fall faint or sick till I reach at last to the goal, and I pray that the rope may choke me quick and Christ receive my soul. Hatch House, 1893 End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Song by Lord Alfred Douglas Steal from the meadows, rob the tall green hills, ravish my orchard's blossoms, let me bind a crown of orchard flowers and daffodils, because my love is fair and white and kind. Today the thrush has trilled her daintiest phrases, flowers with their incense have made drunk the air. God has bent down to gild the hearts of daisies, because my love is kind and white and fair. Today the sun has kissed the rose tree's daughter, and sad Narcissus, spring's pale acolyte, hangs down his head and smiles into the water, because my love is kind and fair and white. Crabbit Park, 1894. End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Plaint Eternel by Lord Alfred Douglas The sun sinks down, the tremulous daylight dies, Down their long shafts the weary sunbeams glide, The white-winged ships drift with the falling tide, Come back, my love, with pity in your eyes. The tall white ships drift with the falling tide. Far, far away I hear the sea mews cries. Come back, my love, with pity in your eyes. There is no room now in my heart for pride. Come back, come back, with pity in your eyes. The night is dark. The sea is fierce and wide. There is no room now in my heart for pride, Though I become the scorn of all the wise. I have no place now in my heart for pride, The moon and stars have fallen from the skies. Though I become the scorn of all the wise, Thrust, if you will, sharp arrows in my side. Let me become the scorn of all the wise. Out of the east I see the morning ride. Thrust, if you will, sharp arrows in my side. Play with my tears and feed upon my sighs. Wound me with swords, put arrows in my side. On the white sea the haze of noonday lies. 
play with my tears and feed upon my sighs but come my love before my heart has died drink my salt tears and feed upon my sighs westward the evening goes with one red stride come back my love before my heart has died down sinks the sun the tremulous daylight dies come back my love before my heart has died out of the south i see the pale moon rise down sinks the sun the tremulous daylight dies the white-winged ships drift with the falling tide end of poem this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. John Quill and Fleur de Lys by Lord Alfred Douglas Recording by Rob Marland John Quill was a shepherd lad, white he was as the curded cream, hair like the buttercups he had, and wet green eyes like a full chalk stream. His teeth were as white as the stones that lie down in the depths of the sun-bright river, and his lashes danced like a dragonfly with drops on the gauzy wings that quiver. His lips were as red as round ripe cherries, and his delicate cheeks and his rose-pink neck were stained with the colour of dog-rose berries when they lie on the snow like a crimson fleck. His feet were all stained with the cowslips and grass to amber and verdigris, and through his folds one day did pass the young prince Fleur de Lys. Fleur de Lys was the son of the king. He was as white as an onyx stone. His hair was curled like a daffodil ring, and his eyes were like gems in the queen's blue zone. His teeth were as white as the white pearls set round the thick white throat of the queen in the hall, and his lashes were like the dark silk net that she binds her yellow hair withal. His lips were as red as the red rubies the king's bright dagger hilt that deck, and pale rose-pink as the amethyst is were his delicate cheeks and his rose-pink neck. His feet were all shod in shoes of gold, and his coat was as gold as a blackbird's bill is, with jewel on jewel manifold, and wrought with a pattern of golden lilies. When Fleur de Lys espied Jonquil, he was as glad as a bird in May. He tripped right swiftly adown the hill, and called the shepherd boy to play. This fell out ere the sheep-shearing, that these two lads did sport and toy, Fleur de Lys, the son of the king, and sweet Jonquil, the shepherd boy. And after they had played a while, thereafter they to talking fell, and full an hour they did beguile while each his state and lot did tell. For Jonquil spake of the little sheep, and the tender ewes that know their names, and he spake of his wattled hut for sleep, and the country sports, and the shepherd's games. And he plucked a reed from the edge that girds the river bank, and with his knife made a pipe, with a breath like the singing birds when they flute to their loves in a musical strife. And he told of the night so long and still when he lay awake till he heard the feet of the goat-foot god coming over the hill, and the rustling sound as he passed through the wheat. And Fleur de Lys told of the king and the court, and the stately dames and the slender pages, of his horse and his hawk, and his mimic fort, and the silent birds in their golden cages, and the jewelled sword with the damask blade that should be his in his fifteenth spring, and the silver sound that the gold horns made, and the tourney lists, and the tilting ring. And after that they did devise for mirth and sport, that each should wear the other's clothes, and in this guise make play each other's parts to bear. Whereon they stripped off all their clothes, and when they stood up in the sun, 
they were as like one white rose on one green stalk to another one and when jonquil as a prince was shown and fleur de lys as a shepherd lad their mother's selves would not have known that each the other's habit had and jonquil walked like the son of a king with dainty steps and proud haught look and fleur de lys that sweet youngling did push and paddle his feet in the brook and while they made play in this wise unto them all in haste did run two lords of the court with joyful cries that long had sought the young king's son and to john quill they reverence made and said my lord we are come from the king who is sore vexed that thou hast strayed so far without a following then unto them said fleur de lys you do mistake my lords for know that i am the son of the king and this is sweet jonquil my playfellow whereat one of the lords replied thou lying knave i'll make thee rue such saucy words but jonquil cried nay nay my lord tis even true whereat these lords were sore distressed and one made answer bending knee my lord the prince is pleased to jest but jonquil answered thou shalt see sure never yet so strange a thing as this before was seen that a shepherd was thought the son of a king and a prince a shepherd boy to have been now mark me well my noble lord a shepherd's feet go bare and cold therefore they are all green from the sward and a buttercup makes a stain of gold that i am jonquil thus shalt thou know and that this be very fleur de lys if his feet be like the driven snow and mine like the amber and verdigris he lifted up the shepherd's frock that clothed the prince and straight did show that his naked feet all under his smock were whiter than the driven snow he doffed the shoes and the clothes of silk that he had gotten from fleur de lys and all the rest was as white as milk but his feet were like amber and verdigris with that they each took back his own and when this second change was done as a shepherd boy was jonquil shown and fleur de lys the king's true son by this the sun was low in the heaven and fleur de lys must ride away but ere he left with kisses seven he vowed to come another day hatch house eighteen ninety four end of poem this librivox recording is in the public domain a prayer by lord alfred douglas recording by larry wilson often the western wind has sung to me there have been voices in the streams and mirrors and pitiful trees have told me god of thee and i heard not o oh, open thou mine ears the reeds have whispered low as i pass by be strong o friend be strong put off vain fears vex not thy soul with doubts god cannot lie and i heard not o oh, open thou mine ears there have been many stars to guide my feet often the delicate moon hearing my sighs has rent the clouds and shone a silver street and i saw not o oh, open thou mine eyes angels have beckoned me unceasingly and walked with me and from the sombre skies dear christ himself hath stretched out hands to me and i saw not o oh, open thou mine eyes clouds eighteen ninety four End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. In Memoriam, Francis Archibald Douglas by Lord Alfred Douglas. Recording by Shreya Sethi. Why Count Gromlangrig, killed by the accidental explosion of his gun, 
October 18, 1894 Dear friend, dear brother, I have owed you this, since many days the tribute of a song. Shall I cheat you, who never did a wrong, to any man? No, therefore though I miss all art, all skill in this short armistice, from my soul's war against the bitter throng of present foes, let these poor lines be strong, in love enough to bear a brother's kiss. Dear saint, true knight, I cannot weep for you, nor if I could, would, I call back the breath to your dear body. God is very wise, all that this year had in its womb, he knew. And loving you, he sent his son like death to put his hand over your kind grey eyes. 1895 End of poem This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Image of Death by Lord Alfred Douglas Recording by Larry Wilson I carved an image colored like the night, winged with huge wings, stern-browed and menacing, with hair caught back and diademed like a king. The left hand held a scepter, and the right grasped a sharp sword. The bitter marble lips were curled and proud. The yellow topaz eyes, each eye a jewel, stared in fearful wise. The hard, fierce limbs were bare, and from the hips a scourge hung down and on the pedestal I wrote these words. O oh, all things that have breath, this is the image of the great god Death. Pour ye the wine, and bind the coronal. Pipe unto him with pipes, and flute with flutes. Woo him with flowers and spices odorous. Let singing boys with lips mellifluous make madrigals, and low his ears with lutes. Anon bring sighs and tears of harsh distress and weeping wounds so haply ye may move a heart of stone from breasts of hate suck love or garner pity from the pitiless end of poem this librivox recording is in the public domain ve victus by lord alfred douglas recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c here in this isle the summer still lingers and autumn's brown fingers so busy the while with the leaves in the north are scarcely put forth in this land where the sun still glows like an ember in mid-november in england it's cold and the yellow and red of october have fled and the sun is wet gold like an emperor weeping when death goes a reaping all through his empire merciless comer the dead things of summer the sky has cried so that the earth is all sodden with dead leaves in trodden and the trees to and fro wave their arms in the air in despair in despair they are thinking of all the hot days that are over and the cows in the clover here the roses are out and the sun at high noon makes the birds faint and swoon but the crickets about with his song and the hum of the bees as they come to feast at the honey board laden and groaning makes musical droning but vainly, alas, do I hide in the south, kiss close with my mouth, red flowers, green grass, for autumn has found me and thrown her arms round me. She has breathed on my lips, and I wander apart, dead leaves in my heart. Capri, 1895 End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.
The Garden of Death by Lord Alfred Douglas. Recording by Valentina Vicelli. There is an isle in an unfurrowed sea that I wot of, whereon the whole year round the apple blossoms and the rosebuds be in early blooming, and a many sound of ten stringed lute, and most mellifluous breath of silver flute, and mellow half heard horn, making unmeasured music. Tither death coming like love takes all things in the morn of tenderest life and being a delicate god in his own garden takes each delicate thing unstained unmellowed immature untrod tremulous betwixt the summer and the spring the rosebud ere it come to be a rose the blossom ere it win to be a fruit the virginal snowdrop and the dove that knows only one dove for lover all the loot of young soft things and all the harvesting of unripe flowers never comes the moon to matron fullness here no childbearing vexes desire, and the sun knows no noon, but all the happy dwellers of that place are reckless children, gotten on delight by beauty that is thrall to death, no grace, no natural sweet they lack, a chrysalid of perfect beauty each, no wisdom comes to mar their early folly, no false laws man made for man, no mouthing prudence numbs their green unthought, or gives their license pause. Young animals, young flowers, they live and grow, and die before their sweet and blossomed breath has learnt to sigh, save like a lover's. Oh, how sweet is youth, how delicate is death. End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. To Sleep by Lord Alfred Douglas Recording by Phil Schampf ah sleep to me thou comest not in the guise of one who brings good gifts to weary men balm for bruised hearts and fancies alien to unkind truth and drying for sad eyes i dread the summons to that fierce assize of all my foes and woes that waits me when thou makest my soul the unwilling denizen of thy dim troubled house where unrest lies my soul is sick with dreaming let it rest false sleep thou hast conspired with wakefulness i will not praise thee i too long beguiled with idle tales where is thy soothing breast thy peace thy poppies thy forgetfulness where is thy lap for me so tired a child end of poem this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Ode to My Soul by Lord Alfred Douglas Recording by Larry Wilson Rise up, my soul, shake thyself from the dust, Lift up thy head that wears an aureole, fulfill thy trust. Out of the mire where they would trample thee, make images of clay, whereon having breathed from thy divinity let them take mighty wings and soar away right up to god out of thy broken past where impious feet have trod build thee a golden house august and vast whereto these worms of earth may some day crawl let there be nothing small henceforth with thee take thou unbounded scorn of all their scorn eternity of high contempt be thou no more forlorn but proud in thy immortal loneliness and infinite distress and being mid mortal things divinely born rise up my soul paris eighteen ninety six end of poem this librivox recording is in the public domain rejected by Lord Alfred Douglas, read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone. Alas, I have lost my God, my beautiful God Apollo. Wherever his footsteps trod, my feet were wont to follow. But oh, it fell out one day, my soul was so heavy with weeping that I laid me down by the way, and he left me while I was sleeping and my soul awoke in the night and i bowed my ear for his fluting and i heard but the breath of the flight 
of wings and the night birds hooting and night drank all her cup and i went to the shrine in the hollow and the voice of my cry went up apollo 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 but he never came to the gate and the sun was hid in a mist and there came one walking late and i knew it was christ he took my soul and bound it with cords of iron wire seven times round he wound it with the cords of my desire the cords of my desire while my desire slept were seven bands of wire to bind my soul that wept and he hid my soul at last in a place of stones and fears where the hours like days went past and the days went past like years and after many days that which had slept awoke and desire burnt in a blaze and my soul went up in smoke and we crept away from the place and would not look behind and the angel that hides his face was crouched on the neck of the wind and i went to the shrine in the hollow where the lutes and the flutes were playing and i cried i am come apollo back to thy shrine from my straying but he would have none of my soul that was stained with blood and with tears that had lain in the earth like a mole in the place of great stones and fears and now i am lost in the mist of the things that can never be for i will have none of christ and apollo will none of me paris 1896 end of poem this librivox recording is in the public domain the travelling companion by lord alfred douglas into the silence of the empty night i went and took my scorned heart with me and all the thousand eyes of heaven were bright but sorrow came and led me back to thee i turned my weary eyes towards the sun out of the leaden east like smoke came he i laughed and said the night is past and done but sorrow came and led me back to thee i turned my face towards the rising moon out of the south she came most sweet to see she smiled upon my eyes that loathed the noon but sorrow came and led me back to thee i bent my eyes upon the summer land and all the painted fields were ripe for me and every flower nodded to my hand but sorrow came and led me back to thee o oh, love o oh, sorrow o oh, desire despair i turned my feet towards the boundless sea into the dark i go and heed not where so that i come again at last to thee end of poem this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Legend of Spinello of Arezzo by Lord Alfred Douglas Spinello of Arezzo long ago, a cunning painter made a large design to grace the choir of St. Angelo therein he pictured the exploits divine of the archangel michael beautiful exceedingly in wrath most terrible until at last that holy place was full of warring angels and that one who fell from the high places of the highest heaven into the deep abyss of lowest hell he pictured too in mad disaster driven before the conquering hosts of paradise and him the painter drew in uncouth shape a foul misshapen monster with fierce eyes of hideous form half demon and half ape and lo it fell out as he slept one night his soul in the sad neutral land of dreams that lies between the darkness and the light was ware of one whose eyes were soft as beams of summer moonlight and withal as sad 
dark was his colour and as black his hair as hyacinths by night his sweet lips had a curve as piteous as sweet lovers wear when they have lost their loves so fair was he so melancholy yet withal so proud he seemed a prince whose woes might move a tree to find a fearful voice and weep aloud he spoke his voice was tunable and mellow but soft as are the western winds that stir the summer leaves and thus he said spinello why dost thou wrong me i am lucifer end of poem this librivox recording is in the public domain Spring by Lord Alfred Douglas Wake up again, sad earth, wake up again I heard the birds this morning singing sweet Wake up again, the sky was crystal clear And washed quite clean with rain And far below my heart stirred with the year Stirred with the year and sighed, O oh, pallid feet Move now at last, O oh, heart that sleeps with pain Rise up and hear the voices in the valleys run to meet, the songs in the shadows, oh, wake up again. Put out green leaves, dead tree, put out green leaves, last night the moon was soft and kissed the air. Put out green leaves, the moon was in the skies, all night she wakes and weaves. The dew was on the grass like fairies' eyes, like fairies' eyes, oh, three so black and bare. Remember all the fruits, the full gold sheaves, for nothing dies. The songs that are, are silences that were. Summer was winter, oh, put out green leaves. Break through the earth, pale flower, break through the earth. All day the lark has sung a madrigal. Break through the earth that lies not lightly yet, and waits thy patient birth. Waits for the jonquil and the violet, the violet, full soon the heavy pall, will be a bed, and in the noon of mirth some rivulet, will bubble in my wilderness some call, will touch my silence, O oh, break through the earth. End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Anui by Lord Alfred Douglas Alas, and oh, that spring should come again upon the soft wings of desired days, and bring with her no anodyne to pain, and no discernment of untroubled ways. There was a time when her yet distant feet, guessed by some prescience more than half divine, gave to my listening ear such happy warning, that fresh, serene, and sweet, my thoughts soared up like larks into the morning, from the dew-sprinkled meadows crystalline. Soared up into the height celestial, and saw the whole world like a ball of fire, fashioned to be a monster playing ball, for the enchantment of my young desire. And yesterday they flew to this black cloud, missing the way to those ethereal spheres, and saw the earth a vision of Aphrodite, and men a sordid crowd and felt the fears and drank the bitter tears, and saw the empty houses of delight. The sun has sunk into a moonless sea, and every road leads down from heaven to hell. The pearls are numbered on youth's rosary. I have outlived the days desirable. What is there left, and how shall dead men sing onto the loosened strings of love and hate? or take the strong hands to beauty's ravishment. Who shall devise this thing, to give high utterance to miscontent, or make indifference articulate? End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Wine of Summer by Lord Alfred Douglas Recording by Rob Marland the sun holds all the earth and all the sky from the gold throne of this midsummer day in the soft air the shadow of a sigh breathes on the leaves and scarcely makes them sway 
the wood lies silent in the shimmering heat save where the insects make a lazy drone and ever and anon from some tree near a dove's enamoured moan or distant rook's faint cawing harsh and sweet comes dimly floating to my listening ear right in the wood's deep heart i lay me down and look up at the sky between the leaves through delicate lace i see her deep blue gown across a fern a scarlet spider weaves from branch to branch a slender silver thread and hangs there shining in the white sunbeams a ruby tremulous on a streak of light and high above my head one spray of honeysuckle sways and dreams with one wild honeybee for acolyte my nest is all untrod and virginal and virginal the path that led me here for all along the grass grew straight and tall and live things rustled in the thicket near and briar rose stretched out to sweet briar rose with slender arms and barred the way to me with many a flowering arch rose pink or white as bending carefully leaving unbroken all their blossoming boughs i passed along a reverent neophyte the air is full of soft imaginings they float unseen beneath the hot sunbeams like tired moths on heavy velvet wings they droop above my drowsy head like dreams the hum of bees the murmuring of doves the soft faint whispering of unnumbered trees mingle with unreal things and low and deep from visionary groves imagined lutes make voiceless harmonies and false flutes sigh before the gates of sleep o oh, rare sweet hour o oh, cup of golden wine the night of these my days is dull and dense and stars are few be this the anodyne of many woes the perfect recompense i thought that i had lost for evermore the sense of this ethereal drunkenness this fierce desire to live to breathe to be but even now no less than in the merry noon that danced before my tedious night i taste its ecstasy taste and remember all the summer days that lie like golden reflections in the lake of vanished years unreal but sweet always soft luminous shadows that i may not take into my hands again but still discern drifting like gilded ghosts before my eyes beneath the waters of forgotten things sweet with faint memories and mellow with old loves that used to burn dead summer days ago like fierce red kings and this hour too must die even now the sun droops to the sea and with untroubled feet the quiet evening comes the day is done the air that throbbed beneath the passionate heat grows calm and cool and virginal again the colour fades and sinks to sombre tones as when in youthful cheeks a blush grows dim hushed are the monotones of doves and bees and the long flowery lane rustles beneath the wind in playful whim gone are the passion and the pulse that beat with fevered strokes and gone the unseen things that clothed the hour with shining raiment meet to deck enchantments and imaginings no joy is here but only neutral peace and loveless languor and indifference and faint remembrance of lost ecstasy the darkening shades increase my dreams go out like tapers i must hence far off i hear night calling to the sea end of poem this librivox recording is in the public domain Ode to Autumn by Lord Alfred Douglas 
Recording by Phil Schimpf. Thou somber lady of down bended head, and weary lashes drooping to the cheek, with sweet sad fold of lips uncomforted, and listless hands more tired with strife than meek, turn here thy soft brown feet, and to my heart unmatched to summer's golden minstrelsy or spring's shrill pipe of joy sing once again sad songs and i to thee well tuned will answer that according part that jarred with those young seasons gladder strain give me thy empty branches for the beers of perished joys thy winds to sigh my sighs thy falling leaves to count my falling tears and all thy mists to dim my aching eyes there is no comfort in thy lips and none in thy cold arms nor pity in thy breast but better tis in gray hours to have grief than to affront the sun with sunless woe when every flower and leaf conspires to make the season merriest the drip of raindrops on the sodden earth the trampled mud-stained grass the shifting leaves the silent hurrying birds the sickly birth of the red sun in misty skies the sheaves of rotting ruined corn the sudden gusts of angry winds the clouds that fly all night before the stormy moon thy desolate moans all thy decays and rusts thy deaths and dirges these are tuned aright to my unquiet soul that sorrow owns but ah thy gentler mood the honeyed kiss of thy faint watery sunshine thy pale gold thy dark red berries and the ambergris that paints the lingering leaves while on the mould their dead make bronze and sepia carpetings that lightly rustle in thy quiet breath these are the shadows of departed smiles the ghosts of happy things these break again the broken heart the whiles thou goest on to winter i to death end of poem this librivox recording is in the public domain harmony de swore by lord alfred douglas Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. From the French of Baudelaire. Voici venir le temps. Now is the hour when, swinging in the breeze, each flower, like a censer, sheds its sweet. The air is full of scents and melodies. O languorous waltz, O swoon of dancing feet. Each flower, like a censer, sheds its sweet. The violins, like sad souls that cry. O languorous waltz, O swoon of dancing feet. A shrine of death and beauty is the sky. The violins are like sad souls that cry. Poor souls that hate the vast black night of death. A shrine of death and beauty is the sky. Drowned in red blood, the sun gives up his breath. This soul that hates the vast black night of death takes all the luminous past back tenderly. Drowned in red blood, the sun gives up his breath. Thine image, like a monstrance, shines in me. End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Le Balcon by Lord Alfred Douglas From the French of Baudelaire Mais des souvenirs, maîtresse des maîtresse Mother of memories, O oh Mistress Queen O oh, all my joy and all my duty thou, The beauty of caresses that have been, The evenings and the hearth remember now, Mother of memories, O oh, Mistress Queen. 
the evenings burning with the glowing fire and on the balcony the rose-stained nights how sweet how kind you were my soul's desire we said things wonderful as chrysolites when evening burned beside the glowing fire how fair the sun is in the evening how strong the soul how high the heaven's high tower o oh, first and last of every worshipped thing your odorous heart's blood filled me like a flower how fair the sun is in the evening the night grew deep between us like a pall and in the dark i guessed your shining eyes and drank your breath o oh, sweet o oh, honey gall your little feet slept on me sister wise the night grew deep between us like a pall i can call back the days desirable and live all bliss again between your knees for where else can i find that magic spell save in your heart and in your mysteries i can call back the days desirable these vows these scents these kisses infinite will they like young suns climbing up the skies rise up from some unfathomable pit washed in the sea from all impurities o oh, vows o oh, scents o oh, kisses infinite End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Ballad of Saint Fetus by Lord Alfred Douglas. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Vetus came tripping over the grass when all the leaves in the trees were green through the green meadows he did pass on the day he was full seventeen the lark was singing up over his head as he went by so leaf and fleet and the flowers danced in white and red at the treading of his nimble feet his neck was as brown as the brown earth is when first the young brown plough boys delve it, and his lips were as red as mulberries, and his eyes were like the soft black velvet. His silk brown hair was touched with bronze, and his brown cheeks had the tender hue that like a dress the brown earth dons when the pink carnations bloom anew he was slim as the reeds that sway all along the banks of the lake and as straight as a rush and as he passed he sang a song and his voice was as sweet as the voice of a thrush he sang of the gardens of paradise and the light of god that never grows dim and the cherubim with the irradiant eyes and the rainbow wings of the serapim and the host as countless as all the days that worships there and ceases not singing and praising god always with lute and flute and angelot and the blessed light of mary's face as she sits among these pleasant sounds and christ that is the prince of grace and the five red flowers that be his wounds and so he went till he came to the doors of the ivory house of his father the king and all through the golden corridors as he passed along he ceased to sing but a pagan priest had seen him pass and heard his voice as he went along through the fields of the bending grass and he heard the words of the holy song and he sought the king where he sat on his throne and the tears of wrath were in his eyes and he said o oh, sire be it known that thy son singeth in this wise 
of the blessed light of mary's face as she sits amidst sweet pleasant sounds and how that christ is the prince of grace and hath five flowers that be his wounds and when the king had heard this thing his brow grew black as a winter night and he bade the pages seek and bring straight away the prince before his sight and vetus came before the king and the king cried out i pray thee son sing now the song that thou didst sing when thou camest through the fields anon and the face of the prince grew white as milk and he answered not but under the band that held his doublet of purple silk round his slight waist he thrust his hand and the king picked up a spear and cried what hast thou there by the waters of Styx? speak or i strike and the boy replied sweet sire it is a crucifix and the king grew black with rage and grief and for a full moment he spake no word and the spear in his right hand shook like a leaf and the vein on his brow was a tight blue cord then he laughed and said in bitter scorn take me this christian fool from my sight lock him in the turret till the morn and let him dance alone to-night he shall sit in the dark while the courtly ball all the gay night sweeps up and down on the polished floor of the golden hall and thus shall he win his martyr's crown thus spake the king and the courtiers smiled and vetus hung his head for shame and he thought i'm punished like a child that would have died for christ's dear name and so twas done and on that night while silk and sword with fan and flower danced in the hall in the golden light prince vetus sat in the lone dark tower but the king bethought him and was moved ere the short summer night was done and his heart's blood yearned for the son he loved his dainty prince his only son and all alone he climbed the stair with the tired feet of a sceptred king and came to the door and lo he was where of the sound of flute and lute playing and as the king stood there amazed the iron door flew open wide and the king fell down on his knees as he gazed at the wondrous thing he saw inside for the room was filled with a soft sweet light of ambergris and apricot and round the walls were angels bright with lute and flute and angelot on lute and angelot they played with their gold heads bowed upon the strings and the soft wind that the slim flutes made stirred in the feathers of their wings and in the midst serene and sweet with the god's light on his countenance was vetus with his gold shod feet dancing in a courtly dance and round him were archangels for michael who guards god's citadel raphael whom children still implore and gabriel and uriel thus long ago was christ's behest and the saving grace that his red wounds be unto this king made manifest and all his land of sicily god sits within the highest heaven his mercy neither tires nor faints 
all good gifts that may be given he gives unto his holy saints this was the joy that fetus gat to dance with angels knee by knee before he came to man's estate god sent us all such company amen Ah, Leibane, eighteen ninety seven. End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The City of the Soul by Lord Alfred Douglas. In the salt terror of a stormy sea there are high altitudes the mind forgets and undesired days are hunting nets to snare the souls that fly eternity but we being gods will never bend the knee though sad moons shadow every sun that sets and tears of sorrow be like rivulets to feed the shallows of humility within my soul are some mean gardens found where drooped flowers are and unsung melodies and all companioning of piteous things but in the midst is one high terraced ground where level lawns sweep through the stately trees and the great peacocks walk like painted kings what shall we do my soul to please the king seeing he hath no pleasure in the dance and hath condemned the honeyed utterance of silver flutes and mouths made round to sing along the wall red roses climb and cling but o oh, my prince lift up thy countenance for there be thoughts like roses that entrance more than the languors of soft lute playing think how the hidden things that poets see in amber eaves or mornings crystalline hide in the soul their constant quenchless light till called by some celestial alchemy out of forgotten depths they rise and shine like buried treasure on midsummer night the fields of fantasy are all too wide my soul runs through them like an untamed thing it leaps the brooks like threads and skirts the ring where fairies danced and tenderer flowers hide the voice of music has become the bride of an imprisoned bird with broken wing what shall we do my soul to please the king we that are free with ample wings untied we cannot wander through the empty fields till beauty like a hunter hurl the lance there are no silver snares and springes set nor any meadow where the plain ground yields oh let us then with ordered utterance forge the gold chains and twine the silken net each new hour's passage is the acolyte of inarticulate song and syllable and every passing moment is a bell to mourn the death of undiscerned delight where is the sun that made the noonday bright and where the midnight moon oh let us tell in long carved lines and painted parable how the white road curves down into the night only to build one crystal barrier against this sea which beats upon our days to ransom one lost moment with a rhyme or if fate cries and grudging gods demur to clutch life's hair and thrust one naked phrase like a lean knife between the ribs of time naples 1897 end of poem this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sonnet on the Sonnet by Lord Alfred Douglas Recording by Rob Marland To see the moment holds a madrigal 
to find some cloistered place, some hermitage for free devices, some deliberate cage wherein to keep wild thoughts like birds in thrall, to eat sweet honey and to taste black gall, to fight with form, to wrestle and to rage, to let the last upon the conquered page the shadows of created beauty fall. This is the sonnet, this is all delight of every flower that blows in every spring, and all desire of every desert place. This is the joy that fills a cloudy night, when, bursting from her misty following, a perfect moon wins to an empty space. End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. A Triad of the Moon by Lord Alfred Douglas Last night my window played with one moonbeam, And I lay watching till sleep came and stole Over my eyelids, and she brought a shoal Of hurrying thoughts that were her troubled team, And in the weary ending of a dream I found this word upon a candid scroll. The nightingale is like a poet's soul. She finds fierce pain in miseries that seem. Ah, me, methought that she should so devise, To seek for pain and sing such doleful bars, That the wood aches and simple flowers cry, And sea-green tears drench mortal lovers' eyes she that is made the lure of those young stars that hang like golden spiders in the sky that she should so devise to find such lore of sifal song and piteous psalmody while joy runs on through summer greenery and all delight is like an open door must then her liquid notes for evermore repeat the colour of sad things and be distilled like cassia drops of agony from the slow anguish of a heart's bruised core nay she weeps not because she knows sad songs but sings because she weeps for wilful food of her sad singing she will still decoy the sweetness that to happy things belongs all night with artful woe she holds the wood, And all the summer day with natural joy. My soul is like a silent nightingale, Devising sorrow in a summer night. Closed eyes in blazing noon put out the light, And hell lies in the thickness of a veil. In every voiceless moment sleeps a wail, And all the lonely darknesses are bright and every dawning of the day is white, with shapes of sorrow, fugitive and frail. My soul is like a flower whose honey bees are pains that sting and suck the sweets untold. My soul is like an instrument of strings. I must stretch these to capture harmonies, and to find songs like buried dust of gold delve with the nightingale for sorrowful things end of poem this librivox recording is in the public domain proem by lord alfred douglas recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c for the third edition of the city of the soul how have we fared my soul across the days through what green valleys confident and fleet along what paths of flint with how tired feet anon we knew the terror that dismays at noonday and when night made dark the ways we bought delight and found remembrance sweet though in our ears we heard the wide wings beat ever we kept dumb mouths to prayer and praise 
yet never lost or spurned or cast aside and never sundered from the love of god through how so wayward intricate deceits lured by what shining toys our charmed feet trod on the swift winds we saw bright angels ride and strayed into the moon made silver streets nineteen ten end of poem this librivox recording is in the public domain dedication to sonnets nineteen o nine by lord alfred douglas recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c what shall i say what word what cry recall what god evoke what star what amulet to make a sonnet pay a hopeless debt or bind a winged heart with a matagrill weak words are vainer than no words at all the barrier of flesh divides us yet your spirit like a bird caught in a net beats ever an impenetrable wall this is my book and there as in a glass darkly beheld the shadow of my mind wavers and flickers like a flame of fire so through your eyes it may be it will pass and i shall hold my wild shy bird confined in the gold cage of shadowless desire in a poem this librivox recording is in the public domain the dead poet by lord alfred douglas recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c i dreamed of him last night i saw his face all radiant and unshadowed of distress and as of old in music measureless i heard his golden voice and marked him trace under the common thing the hidden grace and conjure wonder out of emptiness till mean things put on beauty like a dress and all the world was an enchanted place and then methought outside a fast locked gate i mourned the loss of unrecorded words forgotten tales and mysteries half said wonders that might have been articulate and voiceless thoughts like murdered singing birds and so i woke and knew that he was dead paris nineteen o one end a poem this librivox recording is in the public domain Dies Amara Valdi by Lord Alfred Douglas. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Ah me, ah me, the day when I am dead, and all of me that was immaculate, given to darkness lies in shame or state. Surely my soul shall come to that last bed and weep for all the whiteness that was red standing beside the ravished ivory gate when the pale dwelling place is desolate and all the golden rooms untenanted for in the smoke of that last holocaust when to the regions of unsounded air that which is deathless still aspires and tends whither my helpless soul shall we be tossed to what disaster of malign despair or terror of unfathomable ends nineteen o two end of poem this librivox recording is in the public domain
to a silent poet by lord alfred douglas recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c where are the eagle wings that lifted thee above the ken of mortal hopes and fears and was it thou who in serener years framed magic words with such sweet symmetry didst thou compel the sun the stars the sea harness the golden horses of the spheres and make the winds of god thy charioteers along the roads of immortality art thou dead then nay leave the folded scroll let us keep quiet lips and patient hands not as sheer children use who would unclose the petals of young flowers but paying toll at that high gate where time grave gardener stands waiting the ripe fulfillment of the rose end of poem this librivox recording is in the public domain the traitor by lord alfred douglas recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c cast out my soul the broken covenant forget the pitiable masquerade and that ignoble part ignobly played let us take shame that such a murmur's rent of noble things could pierce the adamant of pride wherewith we ever were arrayed and being with a kiss once more betrayed let not our tears honor that psychophant let him on graves a buried loyalty rise as he may to his desired goal a and god speed him here i grudge him not and when all men shall sing his praise to me i'll not gainsay but i shall know his soul lies in the bosom of iscariot end of poem this librivox recording is in the public domain beauty and the hunter by lord alfred douglas Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. Where lurks the shining quarry, swift and shy, immune, elusive, unsubstantial? In what dim forests of the soul where call? No birds and no beasts creep. The hunter's cry wounds the deep darkness and the low winds sigh through avenues of trees whose faint leaves fall down to the velvet ground and like a pall the violet shadows cover all the sky with what gold nets what silver pointed spears may we surprise her what slim flutes inspire with breath of what serene enchanted air wash we our starward gazing eyes with tears till on their pools drawn by our white desire she bend and look and leave her image there end of poem this librivox recording is in the public domain rewards by lord alfred douglas recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c from the beginning when was aught but stones for english prophets starved not chatterton was keats bay crowned was shelley smiled upon marlowe died timely well for him his groans on stake or rack else had outmoaned the moans of his own edward and that light that shone that voice that trumpet 
that white-throated swan when found he prays save for his honored bones honor enough for bones but for live flesh cold-eyed mistrust and ever watchful fear mingled with homage given grudgingly from cautious mouths and all the while a mesh to snare the singing bird to trap the deer and bind the feet of immortality the academy office 1908 end of poem this librivox recording is in the public domain silence by lord alfred douglas recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c this is a deep hell to be expressionless to leave emotion inarticulate to guess some form of love or joy or hate shadowed in an imperial loveliness behind the hurrying thoughts that crowd and press to track to follow to lie down to wait and at the last before some fearful gate to stand eluded and compassionless oh if proud summer's high magnificence and all the garnered honey of sweet days and sweets of sweeter nights cannot prevail against this spell of tongue-tied impotence how shall we sing my soul when skies are pale and winter suns shed melancholy rays end of poem this librivox recording is in the public domain the green river by lord alfred douglas recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c i know a green grass path that leaves the field and like a running river winds along into a leafy wood where is no throng of birds at noonday and no soft throats yield their music to the moon the place is sealed and unclaimed sovereignty of voiceless song and all the unravished silences belong to some sweet singer lost or unrevealed so is my soul become a silent place oh may i wake from this uneasy night to find a voice of music magnifold let it be shape of sorrow with wan face or love that swoons on sleep or else delight that is as wide-eyed as a merry gold end of poem this librivox recording is in the public domain la beauty by lord alfred douglas recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c from the french of baudelaire fair am i mortals as a stone carved dream and all men wound themselves against my breast the poet's last desire the loveliest voiceless eternal as the world i seem in the blue air strange thinks i brood supreme with heart of snow wither than swan's white crest no moment mars the plastic line i rest with lips untaught to laugh or eyes to stream singers who see in tranced interludes my splendor set with all superb design consume their days in toyful ecstasy to these revealed the starry amplitudes of my great eyes which make 
all things divine are crystal mirrors of eternity end of poem this librivox recording is in the public domain soy sage o ma dolaire by lord alfred douglas recording by linda marie nielsen vancouver b c from the french of Baudelaire. peace be at peace o thou my heaviness thou calledest for the evening lo tis here the city wears a sombre atmosphere that brings repose to some to some distress now while the heedless throng make haste to press where pleasure drives them ruthless charioteer to pluck the fruits of sick remorse and fear come thou with me and leave their fretfulness see how they hang from heaven's high balconies the old lost years in worn clothes garmented and see regret with faintly smiling mouth and while the dying sun sinks in the skies hear how far off night walks with velvet tread and her long robe trails all about the south end of poem this recording is in the public domain To Olive by Lord Alfred Douglas Recording by the Scholar of No Importance of a Scholar of No Importance dot wordpress dot com When in dim dreams I trace the tangled maze of the old years that held and fashioned me and to the sad assize of memory from the wan roads and misty time trod ways the timid ghosts of dead forgotten days gather to hold their piteous colloquy chiefly my soul bemoans the lack of thee and these lost seasons empty of thy praise yet surely thou wast there when life was sweet we walked knee-deep in flowers and thou wast there when in dismay and sorrow and unrest with weak bruised hands and wounded bleeding feet i fought with beasts and wrestled with despair and slept how else upon thine unseen breast i have been profligate of happiness and reckless of the world's hostility the blessed part has not been given to me gladly to suffer fools i do confess i have enticed and merited distress by this that i have never bowed the knee before the shrine of wise hypocrisy nor worn self-righteous anger like a dress yet write you this sweet one when i am dead Love like a lamp swayed over all his days, and all his life was like a lamplit chamber where is no nook, no chink unvisited by the soft affluence of golden rays, and all the room is bathed in liquid amber. Long, long ago you lived in Italy. You were a little princess in a state where all things sweet and strange did congregate, and in your eyes was hope or memory or wistful prophecy of things to be. You gave a child's blank no to proffered fate, then became grave and died immaculate, leaving torn hearts and broken minstrelsy. But love that weaves the years on time's slow loom found you again, reborn, fashioned, and grown to your old likeness in these harsher lands. And when life's day was shattered in deep gloom, you found me, wandering, heartsick and alone, and ran to me and gave me both your hands my thoughts like bees explore all sweetest things to fill for you the honeycomb of praise linger in roses and white jasmine sprays and marigolds that stand in yellow rings in the blue air they moan on muted strings and the blue sky of my soul's summer days shines with your light and through pale violet ways birds bear your name in beatings of their wings i see you all bedecked in bows of rain New showers of rain against new risen suns, new tears against new light of shining joy. My youth, equipped to go, turns back again, throws down its heavy pack of years, and runs back to the golden house, a golden boy. When we were pleasure's minions, you and I, when we mocked grief and held disaster cheap, and shepherded all joys like willing sheep that love their shepherd. 
When a passing sigh was all the cloud that flecked our April sky, I floated on an unimagined deep. I loved you as a tired child of sleep. I lived and laughed and loved and knew not why. Now I have known the uttermost rose of love. The years are very long, but love is longer. I love you so I have no time to hate, even those wolves without. The great ones move all their dark batteries to our fragile gate. The world is very strong, but love is stronger. When I am dead, you shall not doubt or fear, or wander nightly in the halls of gloom. The moon will shine into my empty room, and in the narrow garden, flowers will peer while you look through your window. Scarce a tear will drench your child's blue eyes, while on my tomb, where the red roses wake and break and bloom, the stars gaze down eternal and austere. And I, in the dark anteroom of death, will wait for you with ever outstretched hands and ears strained for your little timid feet, and in the listening darkness, when your breath pants in distress, my arms will be like bands and all my weakness like your winding sheet. 1907. End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Forgetfulness by Lord Alfred Douglas. Recording by Larry Wilson. Alas, that time should war against distress, and numb the sweet ache of remembered loss, and give for sorrow's gold the indifferent dross of calm regret or stark forgetfulness. I should have worn eternal morning dress, and nailed my soul to some perennial cross, and made my thoughts like restless waves that toss on the wild sea's intemperate wilderness. But lo, came life, and with its painted toys lured me to play again like any child. O oh, pardon me this weak inconstancy. May my soul die if in all present joys lapped in forgetfulness, or since beguiled. Yea, in my mirth, if I prefer not thee. End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Premonition by Lord Alfred Douglas. Recording by Larry Wilson. If love reveal himself to haggard eyes, compact of lust and curiosity, and turn a pallid face away from thee to seek elsewhere a harlot's paradise. If faith be perjured, and if truth be lies, and thy great oak of life a rotten tree, where shall we hide, my soul? How shall we flee the eternal fire, the worm that never dies? O oh, born to be rejected and denied, scorn of the years and sport of all the days, must the grave future still repeat the past? O thrice betrayed and seven times crucified, is there no issue from unhappy ways, no peace, no hope, no loving arms at last? La Brague, 1903 End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Witch by Lord Alfred Douglas You cannot build again what you have broken. You cannot bind the words your lips have spoken. You broke the golden bowl and shattered it. You put away remembrance in a pit. You sprinkled earth, you wove a spell and sang, and on its grave certain red lilies sprang. You watered them with a betrayed man's tears and found them fair god send you sighs and fears you bent them to your lust and made them be food for your hell-imagined ecstasy you took remorse and strangled it by night and sank it in a well you bound delight and brought it home the cord that held it fast was the forgetfulness of kindness past you took the price of him you had betrayed and bought you toys and decked yourself and played like any child you were all soft and sweet 
your lovers watched your little dancing feet with glowing eyes too lover blind to see in your white hands clasped close the judas fee you took the price and you have held it still and now far off you see heaven on a hill and dream of peace and gates of pearl unlocked poor fool be not deceived god is not mocked End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Behold, your house is left unto you desolate, by Lord Alfred Douglas. Recording by Larry Wilson. Alas for love and truth and faith, stone dead, borne down by hate to death unnatural, stifled and poisoned. From the empty hall to the dismantled chamber where the bed once held its breathing warmth, the soundless tread of sad ghosts goes by night. Timid and small one creeps and glides. I saw her shadow fall behind me on the floor uncarpeted. Poor wistful semblance of too weak remorse. Why have we met in your forsaken room, where the pale moon looks in on emptiness and holds a lamp to ruin fragile force you come too late my cold heart is a tomb where love lies strangled in his wedding dress twenty six church row nineteen thirteen in the poem this librivox recording is in the public domain the end of illusion by lord alfred douglas Recording by Shreya Sethi And for thou wast a spirit too delicate To act her earthly and abhorred commands Refusing her grand hests She did confine thee into a cloven pine Within which drift imprisoned Thou didst painfully remain a dozen years The Tempest, Act 1, Scene 2 Footnote 1902 to 1914 how wretchedly have i with transodies chained galley slaves of hellborn sorcery gazed on this world as through a shallow sea or glass of colored jewels who is wise that looks to find on earth a paradise or how shall the flame cinctured spirit go free that's harnessed to a fleshy sovereignty or gold wired in a cage of women's lies. You were all Juliet and Rosalind, and Imogen to me. You snared my soul, and would have moulded it like blind wax into the image of your lust, your mind. Is like hell's furnace full of burning coal. I know you now, Circe and Sycorax. Hestinul. 1914 End of poem This LibriVox recording is in the public domain Canker Glooms by Lord Alfred Douglas Recording by Shreya Sethi But for their virtue only is their show They live unwooed and unrespected fade Shakespeare, Sonnet 54 Alas, that evil things should find this gift To be so housed and so caparisoned So lapped in silk and so pavilioned In such sweet tents that we who darkly lift Our still illusioned eyes know not to sift The soaring noble from the falsely fond While virtue, like a needy vagabond with unadmired demeanor makes rude shift. You were all fair without, not so within. I looked at you and loved you. Your bright shell was opal-hued but not inhabited. By honorable jewels, like a sin, you charmed my soul. But ere we came to hell, love died, let now the dead in tomb their dead 1916 
End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Unspeakable Englishman by Lord Alfred Douglas. Recording by Rob Marland. You were a brute and more than half a knave. Your mind was seamed with labyrinthine tracks wherein walked crazy moods bending their backs under grim loads you were an open grave for gold and love always you were the slave of crooked thoughts tortured upon the racks of mean mistrust i made myself as wax to your fierce seal i clutched an ebbing wave fool that i was i loved you your harsh soul was sweet to me i gave you with both hands love service honour loyalty and praise i would have died for you and like a mole you grubbed and burrowed till the shifting sands opened and swallowed up the dream-forged days end of poem this librivox recording is in the public domain Light in Our Darkness by Lord Alfred Douglas Recording by Andrew Gauntz England, 1918 In the high places, lo, there is no light The ugly dawn beats up forlorn and grey Dear Lord, but once before I pass away Out of this hell into the starry night Where still my hopes are set in death's despite Let one great man be good Let one pure ray shine through the gloom Of this my earthly day From one tall candle set upon a height Judges and prelates, chancellors and kings All have I known and suffered and endured And some are quick and some are in their graves I looked behind their masks and posturings and saw their souls too rotten to be cured, and knew them all for liars, rogues, and knaves. End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. English Benedictines by Lord Alfred Douglas. Recording by Lindbury Nielsen. Vancouver, B.C. Chaste poverty, obedience, cloistered peace, and all the trappings of pure holiness. Faces that smile and hands stretched out to bless, from prime to compline, prayers that never cease, and flock of lambs with penance whiten fleece, Troops of fresh boys who pray and sing no less. Devoutly than young angels these express. Your conquered flesh and sanctities increase. But one child's soul bartered for worldly ease. While Judas' fingers pointed the broad road. One heart bereft, one house made desolate. A bot, I tell you, trifles such as these. Now light as air shall be a fearful load when with your monks you stand at heaven's locked gate. Shelley's Folly, 1919 End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On a Showing of the Nativity by Lord Alfred Douglas. Recording by Linda Marie Nielsen, Vancouver, B.C. See where she lies pale and serene and mild, our little virgin meek and innocent, the wistful oval of her face down bent upon the wonder of her newborn child. How frail the stable seems, how fierce and wild, outside the intangible angel circle, blent in fearful hordes the infernal ornament, the dark battalions of 
the unreconciled. I saw the vision of our house of bread. In liquid fire it floated on the air. In the blue deeps of night its shining trail was suddenly in milky radiance shed against the hope which God hath planted there. Even the gates of hell shall not prevail. End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Before a Crucifix by Lord Alfred Douglas. Recording by Larry Wilson. What hurts thee most? The rods, the thorns, the nails, the crooked wounds that jag thy bleeding knees. Can ever plummet sound such mysteries? It is perchance the thirst that most prevails against thy stricken flesh. Thy spirit quails most at the gall soaked sponge. The bitter seas o'erflow with this. Nay, it is none of these. Lord, Lord, reveal it then ere mercy fails. Is it thy mother's anguish? Search thine heart. Didst thou not pray to taste the worst with me, O thou of little faith? Incarnate word, Lord of my soul, I know it is the part that Judas played. This have I shared with thee, by wife, child, friend, betrayed. Thy prayer was heard. End of poem. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Note by Lord Alfred Douglas. Recording by Rob Marland. Good poetry is made up of two things style and sincerity both are requisite in equal degrees as against this proposition we have two main heresies which roughly speaking take in all the bad poetry which is being constantly held up to our admiration by our self-styled critics in the morning post and elsewhere there is the art for art's sake heresy which upholds style at the expense of sincerity and there is what I shall denominate the anti-formal heresy, which, because its exponents cannot acquire or will not take the trouble to acquire the technique of poetry, claims that strict forms and rules in poetry are inimical to it, and may and should be broken whenever it suits the poet to break them. The real poet repels both these heresies with equal force. The average alleged poet of today wobbles from one heresy to the other. Occasionally, and by accident, he may stumble into writing a good poem, and this accounts for the rare oasis of poetry which occasionally rewards the weary traveller through the arid desert of rhymed or unrhymed verse which spreads its dismal expanse all round us. Nowadays, we have the phenomenon of an enormous quantity of bad poets writing interminable reams of indifferent verse. There is not a good poet among the lot, but from time to time one or other of them writes a good poem by accident. The result is that never before in the history of English literature has poetry sunk so low. When a nation which has produced Shakespeare and Marlowe and Chaucer and Milton and Shelley and Wordsworth and Byron and Keats and Tennyson and Blake can seriously lash itself into enthusiasm over the puerile crudities, when they are nothing worse, of a Rupert Brooke, it simply means that poetry is despised and dishonoured and that sane criticism is dead or moribund. The anti-formal heresy can be briefly dismissed. Carried to its logical conclusion, it denies the difference between poetry and prose. Its most extreme exponent was Walt Whitman, who wrote ejaculatory prose and chose to call it poetry. Walt Whitman has been faithfully dealt with by Swinburne, 
the last of the great poets in the succession of poets so i need not waste space over him the average poet who is infected with the anti-formal heresy does not carry it so far as whitman he is content to write decasyllabic lines with an occasional eleven-syllabled line or an alexandrine thrown in between them and when remonstrated with he will say that he has done it on purpose to produce a certain effect as one who should say i always play a few false notes in a chopin concerto i do it on purpose to produce a certain effect or he will write a sonnet and break all the rules or some of them and will tell you that he did it on purpose and because he prefers it that way the real truth being probably that either he did not know any better or was graveled for a rhyme or is afflicted with a faulty ear for rhythm the irish school of poetry with mr yeats at its head is particularly infected with the anti-formal heresy as to the art for art's sake heresy its chief exponent was oscar wilde and the school of wilde and his imitators and admirers rampantly in the ascendant today among our poets and their critics may safely be said to hold the field though it is an undoubted fact that many of the victims of wilde's fallacies in the literary line are quite unconscious of the source of their own convictions concerning the now generally accepted axioms of their art wilde's literary gospel can be summed up by saying that he preached all through his writings that in all art style is of more importance than sincerity and this theory is simply another way of expressing the art for art's sake heresy style is the technique of the art of writing the form into which the artist moulds his ideas two persons may have exactly the same idea and the words by which they respectively express that idea will necessarily fall into the mould of their style to take a concrete example the idea expressed by wordsworth in the first three lines of his sonnet on westminster bridge boldly expressed in prose might be represented as follows it is impossible to conceive any earthly scene which would be more beautiful than this a man who could fail to be impressed by such a majestic spectacle would indeed be dull and soulless this is how wordsworth puts the same idea earth hath not anything to show more fair dull would he be of soul who could pass by a sight so touching in its majesty he takes the idea which might occur to any ordinary man passing over westminster bridge on a fresh and beautiful morning and transmutes it by the alchemy of his style into pure gold quite evidently and indisputably then if one wishes to write finely either in prose or poetry style is of the utmost importance but after all that is no more than to say that it takes a poet to write poetry however sincere a man might be in feeling the beauty of the morning on westminster bridge he could not turn his feeling into poetry unless he had mastered the technique of poetry and surely it is equally certain that unless he sincerely felt the beauty it would never even occur to him to write a poem about it at all further unless a man is so sincere in his feelings of admiration for beauty as to live for a great part of his life under the impulse of such feelings he would not and could not take the necessary pains to acquire such a difficult art as the art of poetry when we say that a poet is born not made we simply mean that certain persons have a natural deep instinct about beauty not possessed by other people which urges them with an irresistible impulse to strive to express what they feel by means of an extraordinarily difficult and complicated art which can only be acquired by taking an enormous amount of trouble nobody i imagine really believes that a poet is born in the sense that he suddenly finds himself in early youth fully equipped 
with all the power to express himself in flawless verse without taking any trouble about it the poet therefore is one who puts into a beautiful form the expression of an overpowering emotion and it follows that his emotion must be quite exceptionally deep and sincere and that it is the motive power of his style which without the emotion to inspire it would be as useless and dumb as an unplayed violin to write poetry without sincerity is merely to play with words but poetry is an affair of the spirit and people who imagine that they're going to turn themselves into great poets by an inordinate admiration of beautiful material things or beautiful people are fostering the most puerile of delusions it follows that when i talk of the preoccupation with beauty as being absolutely necessary to the poet i mean spiritual beauty and nothing else the reason of this is that ethical beauty is at the back of all beauty beautiful forms beautiful sounds beautiful colours beautiful faces are simply the channels by which spiritual perfection is suggested to our spirit and the resulting yearning the desperate struggle upwards of the soul towards the supreme beauty however dimly and darkly felt is what produces all great art whether in poetry or in music or in sculpture or in painting that is why all really great art is founded on and springs from morality beauty in the sphere of the spirit is simply goodness in a greater or less degree the difference between the highest art and art for art's sake corresponds to the difference between philosophy and sophistry having thus defined my conception of poetry and the poet and having indicated what i take to be the two main heresies against which they are essentially opposed i shall not in the limited space at my disposal attempt to follow those heresies into all their ramifications to do justice to the subject would require a fairly lengthy book i shall confine myself to making a few remarks about the sonnet because it has always been my favourite instrument of expression in poetry and because i may safely say that no other english poet with the exception of rossetti a master of form but to my mind distinctly infected with the art for art's sake heresy has devoted so much laborious work to it incidentally in passing i will quote my own words and postulate that poets except in penny novelettes do not pour out words like inspired gramophones all good poetry is written slowly and cautiously with great effort and unspeakable groanings of the spirit it is forged slowly and painfully and link by link with sweat and blood and tears the writing of a great poem leaves a poet exhausted persons who pour out words are rhetoricians and not poets at all a recent writer on the english sonnet has taken as the main thesis of a valuable and in spite of blunders and blemishes a stimulating book the theory that the sonnet is the cornerstone of english poetry and that all the finest poets have been either fine sonneteers or unconscious workers in the sonnet movement and that there is no poetry of the highest that does not in some sort distinguishably ally itself with sonnet poetry i dissent altogether from these propositions i think they're fantastic and not in any way borne out by the facts so far from the sonnet being the cornerstone of english poetry it would i think be very easy to prove that it has always been a somewhat forlorn exotic and that very few of the great english poets have thoroughly understood it however as the author of the book to which i am referring has made his theory the vehicle for a fine and spirited appreciation of poetry and the sonnet and as his theory does not involve any fundamental heresy i shall not here further join issue with him having said what i had to say on the matter in another place 
it is otherwise when i come to consider the attack which he has made on the rhyming of words ending with the e or e sound and words ending in y such an attack is dangerous to poetry and unless it is answered in view of the fact that the author of the book speaks with a certain amount of authority and is himself though tainted with the anti-formal heresy a not inconsiderable poet it might have a very disastrous effect on those aspiring youths who may take him as an infallible guide i am the more concerned to answer him inasmuch as he has done me the honour of taking fourteen rhymes of my own out of my sonnets published in nineteen o nine and putting them in a pillory as examples of careless rhyming it is to be remarked that he does not mention my name and in discussing his charge against me i am returning the compliment if it be a compliment i now quote what he says a collection of nineteen otherwise excellent sonnets published recently has the following rhymes me memory colloquy thee hostility me knee hypocrisy italy memory b minstrelsy loyalty me ecstasy eternity grudgingly immortality the symmetry c immortality curiosity the tree flee inconstancy the thus is poetical indolence justified of her children and thus is the writing of sonnets reduced to a species of kindergarten entertainment of course we must still love and be thankful for these easy and inspired purveyors of easy and uninspired rhyming but how much more closely we could have loved them and how much more thankful could we have been for them if they had toiled a little as well as spun i cannot do better in reply to this somewhat spiteful onslaught than to reproduce the appended extracts from a letter which i sent the gentleman in question as soon as i noticed the passage above quoted from his book shelley's folly lose february twenty fifth nineteen eighteen dear blank cast your eye over the following rhymes taken from shakespeare's sonnets die memory husbandry posterity legacy free usury thee the posterity these last two in the same sonnet i majesty astronomy quality sky memory i alchemy poverty injury the melancholy i gravity die wantonly eternity asterisk posterity asterisk liberty injury pry jealousy i remedy antiquity asterisk iniquity asterisk last two in the same sonnet fortify memory cry jollity authority asterisk simplicity last two in the same sonnet impiety asterisk society asterisk memory eternity fly majesty i history die dignity idolatry b prophecies eyes flattery alchemy tyranny uncertainty canopy eternity lies subtleties constancy asterisk c asterisk by remedy i have left out the innumerable rhymes of the me b c etc the rhymes i have marked with an asterisk are bad rhymes because there is the same consonant sound in them nowhere in my sonnets have i used such rhymes footnote this statement is not quite correct in some of my earlier sonnets i have been occasionally guilty of this lapse End footnote. and my rhymes which you pilloried in your book page two sixty are every one of them correct 
and in most cases beautiful and carefully sought out also it is to be noted that i have written all my sonnets in the strictest petrarchan form which makes much greater demands on rhyme than the easy shakespearean sonnet which since it avoids all the technical difficulties is not really a sonnet at all i have no time to wade through wordsworth's sonnets but the two best quoted in your book have by majesty a beautiful rhyme and free tranquillity equally good in short what you try to impute to me as a blemish is an ornament the truth is of course that rhymes of this character belong to the genius of the english language and form one of its greatest beauties the frequency with which they have been used by all our greatest poets without any exception whatever is accounted for partly by their beauty and partly by the great quantity of words in our language which end with the e and y sounds in conclusion i should like to point out that what i and the author of the book i have referred to call the strict petrarchan form of the sonnet is in my opinion the best and the most beautiful personally i have never used any other and i was using it at least fifteen years before the gentleman in question had either written a sonnet himself or set up as an authority on the subject at the same time it must be observed that there is no real authority for calling it the best form the author of the book i have referred to is apparently not aware that petrarch was not the inventor of the sonnet in italy and that even he petrarch himself occasionally has a rhymed couplet at the end of his sestets a little knowledge is a dangerous thing as regards my own poems which are now collected together in this volume i should like to say that they comprise work scattered over a period of nearly thirty years for the childish egoism and the dubious morality of such pieces as apologia and ode to my soul and one or two of the earlier sonnets i hold no kind of brief but at the same time i have felt that while i might be justified in altering and revising faults of technique it would be foolish to change the essential character of pieces which are representative of various stages of my development as a man and as a poet accordingly i have left them exactly as they were written certain other poems of mine which appeared in an edition published in paris in eighteen ninety six with a french translation i have refrained from putting into this collected edition for the same reason which caused me to refuse to include them in the city of the soul published in eighteen ninety nine third edition published nineteen eleven and which impelled me to withhold permission for the republication of the entire paris edition which has been more than once urged on me by the mercure de france who were my first publishers i am well aware that having written these poems i cannot escape responsibility for them and i have no kind of doubt that after my death they will eventually be reprinted my reason for omitting them from this edition is that although there is no actual harm in them they lend themselves to evil interpretations and the fact that they have been so interpreted by those whose interest it has been to attack and defame me and that they have actually been used against me in the law courts by the very persons who most applauded them at the time they were written has given me a distaste for them which such poetical merits as they may possess are insufficient to dispel alfred bruce douglas shelley's folly lose february nineteen nineteen end of section this librivox recording is in the public domain end of the collected poems of lord alfred douglas